Well, hey everybody, welcome to Film School for Teens. My name is Chris and today's episode, episode two, is going to be one that is quite extraordinary. So we have director Ken Quapis on the show. So typically when we reach out to these guys, we ask them for 30 minutes of their time to talk to you students and talk to us about filmmaking, their aspect of the industry, and everything that goes along with that. Ken decided to do something different. So he's actually not just a director for about 40 years, but he's also an author. He wrote a book called, But What I Really Want to Do is Direct. In that book, he has a chapter called The Director's Checklist, and he made a presentation just for film school for teens, just for you students. And, I, and I'm so excited to share it because it's extraordinary. So this is going to be a great episode. If you're listening to this, you can watch it here on YouTube. The link is in the show notes. And if you're watching, you can also listen to it. The link for that is also in the description below. So make sure you guys pay attention because this is, this is incredible. It's so awesome. And I hope you guys get a lot of value out of it. So Ken Quapis, who has directed The Office, Space Force, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, Big Miracle, Malcolm in the Middle, Parks and Rec, and just dozens and dozens of other TV shows and features. He's going to take it away from here. So, guys, I present Ken Quapis. Thank you for having me. For nearly 40 years, I've been a director of feature films and television series. And over that time, I've developed a list of directorial reminders, things to help me when I'm preparing a scene. What I want to do is go through my list. There are nine items, some very basic, others rather offbeat, and occasionally run a clip to illustrate a concept. After that, I want to show you a scene from a film I directed, The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, and discuss how I applied these directorial tips to that scene. So the first item on my list is what I call the emotional roadmap. As a director, you need a clear idea of every character's journey. Part of your job on the set is to remind the actor where he or she is on that particular journey. And there are different ways to describe this journey. Some prefer the phrase through line or character arc, but I like the visual of a map. So before digging into any specific scene, I step back and survey the map. Does the main character have an overarching goal in the story? What circumstances shape the character's life prior to the story? Sometimes there's not much information in a script about a character's backstory, but you can usually find some clue, some tidbit that allows you to invent circumstances about a character that will fire up your actor's imagination whether the actor is the lead in your story or merely has one line of dialogue. And by the way, on the set, you need to be attentive to all the actors, a point I'll circle back to. The concept of an emotional roadmap applies just as much to series as to features. I helped launch NBC's comedy, The Office. The main character, Michael Scott, has a very clear overarching goal. He's convinced that he's a comic genius. And his goal is to make sure that the documentary crew filming daily life at Dunder Mifflin Paper Company captures his brilliance on display. So once you identify the character's overall goal, now look at the individual scene. Is there a specific goal? And what tactics does your character employ to achieve that goal? Now the word tactics is a good segue to reminder number two on my list Namely, try and come up with playable notes for your actors. Some of you may have acting experience and you know how frustrating it is to get a note from a director that's simply not playable. I've heard more than a few directors tell an actor to make it funnier. Well, that's not a playable note. That, that's a so-called, quote, result-oriented note. Here's another kind of result-oriented note. A director may give an actor a, a line reading Let's consider a well-known line of dialogue from the movie Scarface. Say hello to my little friend. An unimaginative director might say to the actor, I want you to really hit the word friend. Say hello to my little friend. Well, that's essentially treating your actor like a dialogue spewing robot. It's always better to remind your actor what he or she needs to achieve in the scene 
and using active verbs give them different tactics to achieve their goal. Here's an example. Let's say your character needs someone to lend her $1,000. She might plead, cajole, insist, beg. Those are all active verbs, ones that your actor can sink her teeth into. And personally, I love encouraging actors to change tactics from take to take. So please remember the word tactics when we get to the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. You'll notice that I haven't mentioned anything about visuals yet. That's because when I prepare a scene, I try to work from the inside out. I wanna make sure I understand. I wanna make sure I really grasp the emotional content first. Then I can pre-visualize the action in a way that supports the emotional content. But now let's add images. The third reminder on my list is simply this, tell your story with pictures. How much information can you convey without any dialogue? Can you, for instance, visualize the dynamic between the characters? And when I use the word dynamic, I'm thinking about, for instance, who has the upper hand in a scene? Who has the high status? And if the dynamic shifts over the course of the scene, can you represent the shift visually rather than relying on dialogue? Can you convey a character's intentions without speech? If your character, for example, is a young attorney about to try his first case, what image, what image conveys his sense of confidence or his sense of anxiety? As an exercise, I encourage you to watch TV shows or films without the sound in order to see just how much is being communicated visually. Now, some of you may raise the question, what if you're directing a scene that's inherently not visual? Example, two people talking on the telephone. We'll hold that thought. We'll get back to that. My fourth directorial reminder is one that I wish more directors would consider. Namely, can you use body language to tell your story? How can your actor physicalize the emotional content? Can we understand the gist of the scene just by watching a character's back or a hand? So let's look at two clips that illustrate just how expressive a hand or a back can be. The first clip is from the World War I drama, All Quiet on the Western Front, directed by Lewis Milestone in 1930. Here's the setup. A German soldier spots a butterfly outside of his trench. Reaching for the butterfly, he inadvertently gives away his position and a sniper kills him. So let's watch how Lewis Milestone stages this scene. So as you can see, the hand inches toward the butterfly, recoils from the gunshot, droops to the mud. There's no close-up of the character's face. Body language does all the work. Here's another example. This is from the World War II drama, Saving Private Ryan, directed by Steven Spielberg. Here's the setup for this scene. An army chaplain 
arrives at the Ryan home to deliver the heartbreaking news that another one of the Ryan boys has been killed in action. Let's watch the clip. So as you can see, Spielberg keeps the camera behind Mrs. Ryan as she awkwardly collapses to the floorboards. At the emotional peak of the scene, there's no close-up of the character we're most invested in. And I would argue that the actor's physicality is more powerful than any close-up would have been. Now, before we go on, I wanna circle back to the idea of being attentive to all the actors, no matter how big or small their role. In this scene, the chaplain gets out of the car and sits next to Mrs. Ryan. That is the sum total of his role in the film. But a good director will give that actor a playable note to help him create the inner life of the chaplain. For example, I might pose the note in the form of a question to the actor. How many times this morning has the chaplain been required to deliver such terrible news? Or how does this particular chaplain console a grieving parent? Again, the scene doesn't include the action of the chaplain consoling Mrs. Ryan, but asking the actor what the character might do helps him create a sense of inner life that I promise you the audience will feel. The fifth item on our checklist is shot selection. Here are a few questions I ask myself when pre-visualizing a scene. Is there an overall visual concept for the film or series? The Office, for example, has a distinct visual concept. It's a fake documentary. Every shot choice should reinforce the illusion that there's a documentary crew catching by chance the day-to-day -day lives of the paper company employees. I helped set the style of the show and I wanted the audience to have a sense that the documentary crew, the documentary crew was never prepared for what might happen at any given moment. For instance, if a scene begins with Michael Scott coming out of his office, I, I would aim the camera in the wrong direction, away from Michael's office, forcing the camera operator to scramble and quote, find the action as it unfolds. More questions about shot selection include, are you using the same visual approach in every scene? And by the way, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Think of a film like Harold Ramis's Groundhog Day in which repetition of shots is crucial to the story. Or think of the first half of Stanley Kubrick's Vietnam War film, Full Metal Jacket, in which visual repetition conveys the monotony of basic training. Here's one last question. In a dialogue scene, should the characters be the same size? Put another way, should their image sizes be balanced? That is, if you see you know, uh, character A, in this size, should character B be the same size? Many believe that is the proper way to shoot a dialogue scene, but why? 
Again, we'll return to this question when we get to Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Reminder number six, use color and light to tell your story. This is a subject we could spend the rest of the day discussing. Here's a recent example of a director using color, color temperature specifically, as a storytelling tool. I assume that many of you saw Greta Gerwig's adaptation of Louisa May Alcott's novel, Little Women. The director and her screenwriting partners took a story that was originally told in chronological order and created a fractured time structure, shifting back and forth over the span of a decade or so. Often there are back-to-back -back scenes featuring the same actors, but at different points in time. And to keep the viewer oriented, Gerwig uses color temperature, meaning are the color values warm or cool to let us know where we are in the timeline. It's simple, but so effective. We're never unsure of our place in this new version of the classic story. Now that's an example of using color for clarity's sake, but color and light can also convey the subtext of a scene or even the theme of an entire film. Let's look at a clip from Bernardo Bertolucci's film, The Conformist. Here's the setup. We meet an Italian couple. They're discussing their upcoming honeymoon, which we'll learn will take place in Paris. And what we'll also learn in a later scene is that the husband-to-be has an ulterior motive for wanting to honeymoon in Paris. Namely, he's part of a plot to assassinate an Italian emigre living there. Gotcha. So the combination of her striped dress and the shadows cast by the Venetian blinds create this riot of crisscrossing lines. And for me, it suggests prison bars and that these two characters are prisoners. Uh, prisoners of what exactly? conventional ideas, middle-class conformity. I can't say for certain, but the title of the film, The Conformist, certainly offers a clue. My seventh reminder is a concept that comes from the world of literary criticism, and it's called the objective correlative. I'm not gonna go into detail about the origin of this concept, though I definitely get into it in my book, but what I will ask you is this, can a prop, convey the subtext of a scene? Can a piece of wardrobe represent a character's arc? For you admirers of the show Breaking Bad, think of Walter White's pork pie hat and how it reflects his character's emotional journey. Can furniture tell a story? Hmm. Well, let's go back to the office again and look specifically at the relationship between the characters Pam and Jim. Now, as the director of the pilot, part of my job was to design the layout of the Dunder Mifflin bullpen. And there were a lot of questions I had to deal with. For instance, should the bullpen have an open plan? Should everyone work in cubicles? How should the characters relate in the space? Well, from the get-go, Pam and Jim's friendship is fraught with tension. They are obviously attracted to each other, but she has a boyfriend and soon she'll be engaged to him. The question is, can their desk arrangement tell that story? Can the way their chairs interact create an objective correlative of the tension between them? Uh, last year, I was a guest on the podcast Office Ladies, hosted by the actors Jenna Fisher, who plays Pam, and Angela Kinsey, who plays Angela, the accountant in the show. And what I want to do is show you a clip from the podcast. It's a visual clip from the podcast, and the subject Pam and Jim's desks. Do you remember spending a lot of time thinking about the relationship between Pam's chair and, and Jim's chair? I mean, Pam's 
you know, your, your reception area was always where it was, but it was a question of where would Jim sit? And it seems now like, how could it not be what it was? But I love the idea that you always look at Jim and Jim has to turn to look at you. It's like the simplest thing, but I thought that somehow the way your desk's related would help tell the Pam Jim story. And nothing makes me happier than some of the shots we did where like John's in profile in the foreground and you're in the background, Jenna, like gazing at him. And he either is unaware that you're looking at him or he's completely pretending to be unaware and he knows yes. very well that you're looking at him. So I feel like that was actually something uh, that was like a key moment in setting setting up the Dunder Mifflin world. Again, their desk arrangement acts as an objective correlative of their relationship. And it inspired me to come up with a signature image for the show as a whole. As aspiring directors, I really urge you to just imagine how a prop or a piece of wardrobe or even the space itself can reinforce the emotional content of the story. Reminder number eight is to think about how you can use off-screen space to tell your story. Often, what we don't see is more compelling than what we do. Sometimes it's just as important to manipulate what's outside the frame as it is to choreograph what's contained within it. Now, here's an example from Mike Nichols's film, The Graduate. And in this short, wordless scene, Benjamin lies in bed watching TV while Mrs. Robinson gets dressed to leave. And by the way, that's probably all the scene description said in the script. Quote, Benjamin watches TV while Mrs. Robinson gets dressed. But look how Mike Nichols choreographs this very simple action. Oh, and by the way, he didn't come up with this idea on the spot. The scene was carefully planned. And what I'd love to do is share with you the original storyboards drawn by master storyboard artist, Harold Michelson. The first shot in the storyboards labeled 74 is an insert of the television set. On it, there seems to be a test pattern playing. Then we cut to Benjamin, shot 75. Now there's a frame within the frame that suggests that we're gonna start close and pull out to reveal Benjamin lying in bed. As the shot continues, Mrs. Robinson enters frame and as the scene unfolds, Mrs. Robinson crisscrosses in and out of frame. She finally enters right to left. The camera pans with her to the door and she leaves. Swelled with rain Maybe she will stay Resting in my arms again The ninth and final item on our to-do list is to be mindful of transitions from one scene to the next. I would argue that most transitions are pretty flabby and uninteresting. I mean, how many times have we watched a restaurant scene that begins with a waiter carrying a tray, the camera panning with the tray until it stops at our main character's table? It's dull, and I'm guilty of having done it a few times. Uh, let's look at a famous transition. This is from Stanley Kubrick's film, 2001, A Space Odyssey. In the scene, we watch a prehistoric primate toss a bone into the air. At that point, the director, Stanley Kubrick, cuts to a new scene, several thousand years later, featuring a spaceship circling the Earth. Now, let me set up this transition with a little more detail. This primate has just made an earth-shattering discovery, namely that he can use a bone as a weapon. And that discovery leads to the scene we're about to watch.
Let me point out two things about this transition. First, it was planned. The actor in the primate costume didn't just impetuously throw the bone into the air. The transition was carefully designed. And second, for me, what gives the transition energy is contrast. Now the shape of the bone and the shape of the spaceship that replaces it are pretty much the same, but what a contrast in image size, a close-up of an object no longer than say 12 inches juxtaposed to an extreme wide shot of a spaceship the size of a building. As a filmmaker, contrast is your friend and I urge you to write the word contrast on a post-it and keep it in front of you at all times. The bottom line, a well-designed transition makes the viewer feel that someone's in charge of the storytelling. Someone is at the wheel. So now let's move on to the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. I chose this scene from Sisterhood for two reasons. First, it's emotionally powerful. And second, on the surface, there's nothing visually compelling about the action. It's a phone conversation. Here's the setup. Carmen, played by America Ferrara, is excited to spend her summer holiday with her divorced father, Al, played by Bradley Whitford. Upon arriving at his new home, however, Carmen is shocked to find that Al is living with a new fiance, Lydia, and that she has several children of her own. Needless to say, it's a punch in the gut. Al should have warned her. Carmen's much anticipated holiday quickly goes off the rails and she unceremoniously returns home. Her best friend, Tibby, played by Amber Tamblin, convinces Carmen to confront her father on the phone. And here's the scene. America's performance gives the scene its emotional charge, but there are a lot of craft choices that support the emotional content. Let's circle back to a few items on our checklist, starting with 
color and light with the focus on contrast. So the phone call takes place in two kitchens and I wanted as much contrast between the kitchens as possible. Al and Lydia's kitchen is white. It represents his new you know, white bread suburban family. It's clean and uncluttered, which perfectly reflects Al's character. He's a conflict averse guy. Emotions are messy, better to keep them at arm's length. And the kitchen is appropriately spotless. Carmen's kitchen has orange walls. There are splashes of color everywhere. It perfectly represents her vibrant personality. And simply by intercutting these visually distinct spaces, you create cinematic energy. Now here's a wonderful anecdote. For Al's close-ups, I told my cinematographer, John Bailey, that I wanted everything in the frame to be white. And when I arrived to review the shot, I was surprised to find a bowl of lemons on the kitchen table. And I said, John, we talked about this. Everything is supposed to be white. And he replied, that's exactly why the lemons are there. A burst of yellow is the very thing that enables the eye to perceive everything else as white. So let's talk about body language. This is a talky scene, but I wanted physicality to play a role. Al starts the scene on his feet. He and Lydia are conferring with a wedding planner. Carmen is seated. He's the parent, she's the child, but as she takes him to task, the power dynamic flips. As she stands up for herself, he sits down. And I plan the cutting so that the moment America rises, Bradley takes a seat. It's a small but significant craft choice that physicalizes the power shift between the characters. Here's another simple but compelling body language choice. I asked Bradley to cover his face with his hand as the scene progressed. Al's ashamed, and I wanted to create the sense that he's almost hiding his shame from the audience. He spends most of the scene shielding himself, his hand sort of tensely draped against his cheek. Let's talk about shot selection. I asked earlier if two people are engaged in a conversation should they have the same image size? Well, the answer, absolutely not. In addition to asking Bradley to cover his face, I chose not to shoot any conventional frontal shot of him at all. He's only seen in profile, his face completely obscured. Conversely, I wanted to visually reinforce the sense of Carmen unloading her feelings. So I framed her in an uncomfortably tight close-up. I wanted the viewer to feel trapped by her outpouring of emotion. And by the way, Amber Tamblin has no dialogue in the scene, but her presence is critical. She's like a, a sentry protecting Carmen. She's got Carmen's back as it were. Amber never moves. She doesn't even look at Carmen once the phone conversation begins. My original thought for Tibby, Amber's character, was to exit, effectively giving Carmen the floor. But on the shooting day, it seemed more powerful for Tibby to just remain in the background as if guarding the perimeter. Now, toward the end of the scene, I asked America to make a slight move, just a little step to her right. And we pan with Carmen. And now Tibby is excluded from the frame. Carmen is alone in the shot. And I wanted the image to suggest that she doesn't need any backup. She's got this now. So finally, let's talk about the emotional roadmap and playable notes, the first two items on our list. America and I discussed Carmen's overall journey at great length. She loves her father. She misses him deeply. She's determined to enjoy a wonderful summer with him, but he foils her plans. In this scene, Carmen has a very specific goal, namely to be acknowledged. America did many takes of this scene. She had an inexhaustible reservoir of energy. And from take to take, I gave her different tactics to achieve her goal. I remember saying, reason with your father, or in a different take, attack your father, demand that he acknowledge you, coax him into acknowledging you. I also suggested that at any moment she could switch tactics. You start by reasoning with your dad, but the moment he says, Carmen, you don't have to apologize. You realize how clueless he is and you decide in that moment that the only way to achieve your goal is to basically destroy him. These were playable notes and each take gave America a chance to try a different line of attack. I wasn't aiming 
for any definitive version of the scene. My goal was to keep the actor, excuse me, my goal was to give the actor notes that would inspire her to just keep exploring. Okay, here's a sidebar. Each take America did was very emotional. And at one point, one of my producers pulled me aside, worried that America's acting was too big. It was over the top. And there's an old saying, my producer reminded me that if the character doesn't cry, the audience will. Well, this was not helpful to me in the least. As we continued shooting, I, I simply couldn't bring myself to rein in America's intensity. It, it felt 100% honest. I mean, the scene is a major catharsis for Carmen. And I felt that pulling back the floodgates was a chicken move. So months later, we previewed the film. We had a packed house, mostly young women in the audience. And when this scene began, I knew it was, it was a white knuckle moment for me. And as Carmen let loose this you know, torrent of emotion, two girls in the audience, they were to my left, started laughing. And my producer's warning came back to me in a flash. And I was terrified that the laughter would spread. But a moment later, two girls seated in another part of the theater yelled, shut up. And the laughing girls did shut up. And the audience continued its rapt engagement with the scene. So I suppose if there's a moral to this story, it's that if an honest emotion unsettles your audience, you're probably doing something right as a director. So with all of this in mind, let's take a look at the scene one more time. I've never been able to tell you. T told me what? That I'm angry with you, Dad. This entire thing about you and Lydia and, and the kids. It's my fault. I, I, I should have told you about them before, and I, I'm sorry. Yeah, you should have warned me, but it's more than that. It's, it's the fact that you found yourself this new family, and I feel like some outsider who doesn't even belong to you anymore. It's like you traded me and mom in for something that you thought was better. And I want to know why. Are you ashamed of me? Are you embarrassed? Just tell me, Dad, what did I do wrong? Why did you leave? Why did you have to go? And then tell me that we are going to be closer when that never happened. Then why does Paul visit his alcoholic dad every month? But you only visit me twice a year. And I know you're, you just seem so happy about being Paul and Kristen's dad. But you never even had the time to be mine. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I wish that were enough, Dad. <laughs> so down the road, many of you will no doubt direct a scene that on the surface does not seem visually interesting. And the reason I wanted to share this one with you is that once you grasp the emotional content, you can use an array of tools, color, body language, choreography, contrasting image size to bolster that emotional content. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed the presentation.